Hi, I'm Becca Falborn, your host and executive producer at Lime Studios NYC. And this is Mill Talk, the podcast exploring trends, big ideas, and creative works that relate to advertising, production, and the digital arts. In this week-long series, we'll meet the makers at The Mill, pioneering new technologies that are revolutionizing brand marketing in the virtual and physical worlds. Today's Meet the Makers episode features Associate Creative Director Sally Reynolds. As a multidisciplinary artist with a rich design background, Sally approaches each project with purposeful intention. Her love for science and figurative art influence her work to be thoughtful and emotive. Sally's practice makes her a leading creative mind behind constructing alternate realities. It is intentional work that involves designing for space, interaction, and human context. During our discussion with Sally, we'll delve into effective virtual design principles, the embodiment of avatars, and the social responsibilities of these alternate realities. Welcome, Sally. Thank you for joining us today. Um, We're so excited for our listeners to gain some new insights about the world of immersive technologies and the creation behind these extended realities. So can you tell us a little bit about yourself and what brought you to this point in your career? Um, Sure. Yeah, I'm a a designer by trade. I used to, I worked in, um, I still work in motion graphics and design from a sort of originally graphic design background and then Mm -hmm. through visual effects um, production. And then sort of as, as um, I guess Instagram was the, and Snapchat were the first two sort of platforms and still prominent platforms to really start offering um, augmented reality lenses as part of their offering. And so mm-hmm. I, I sort of started working more and more in, in sort of those social AR platforms and have done for, for quite a few years. And then of course that experience has like pushed me further and further into XR. Um, so mixed reality uh, programs and, um, virtual reality is always definitely a huge love of mine and it's uh super fun to sort of design for so that's I guess my background and how I got into it yeah that's awesome and it's so interesting because um you know you you see these filters on Instagram it's like there's never an end to any of them there are just so (laughs) many of them you 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 can get lost in it almost so um I'd like to set some context around this interview a little bit to start with asking, how do you see the current stage of extended reality? So um, that's sort of, I mean, I I usually sort of start out by defining, well, I used to start out by defining what extended realities is, are, um, and and they're sort of like, I think most people are aware now that it's sort of, they, there originally was augmented reality, mixed reality, and virtual reality is the sort mm-hmm. of three um, buckets, let's say. And extended reality is sort of just all three um, considered to be sort of on this same graph. And it's sort of just a matter of time before like they merge and all become one. Yeah. Um, and, and broadly speaking, what, what sort of keeps them apart is the computing power that's required for each one to function. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, it, AR uh, really just requires a, a device, um, like a phone or something sort of low or more than that. It can be more powerful. Um, mixed reality is very similar, but it, it sort of um, recognizes the environment and objects in the environment and more and more requires, you know, machine learning and, and often requires um, some sort of glasses. Uh-huh. And then virtual reality, of course, is sort of this full immersion where you're in a headset, your sound and audio has been taken over. Um, and I honestly think that I, I, I kind of love that VR is, I think the power of VR is it's full immersion. And I'm not sure if like, you know, AR and MR are all going to sort of combine together with VR. I, I sort of always feel like VR is going to stay separate, but that's my, my take on it. <laughs> So fascinating. And I think for the majority of our listeners, our most frequent and accessible augmented reality application is the use of social media filters, as we were just discussing. So as a designer, how do you ensure the digital realities like spatially register with the real world in real time? And I actually want to just add something because this is like something that happened this morning to me. (laughs) So I have a little ritual where I like listen to music and kind of like dance around my apartment in the morning. It just like makes me like wakes me up a little bit more while I'm making breakfast. And sometimes I'll send like a funny Snapchat filter to my friends of me like mouthing a song. So this morning there's this new pig filter there (laughs) and my friend was dying laughing because every time you turned your face, it like morphed the face of the pig. And she was like, the side view is my favorite because it's so (laughs) weird looking. But so anyway, um, (laughs) 
<laughs> I want, I'm going to instill that ritual in my morning. I think that's great. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I, I mean, obviously the technology keeps it, that keeps it operating well. So you have to have um, robust hardware and a good internet connection and so on for the experience to have like low latency. That's mm -hmm. obviously part of the magic. Um, but of course, designing for that is that, you know, you do design for optimization, keeping the assets like the lowest possible weight, um, without losing the essence of what is creatively required of the content. Mm -hmm. um, and, and for a seamless, you know, experience, which you kind of just touched on with the, the different morphing of the pig face, um, <laughs> designing elements into the actual experience, or in this case, the AR filter that can respond in real time. So inputs such as... Um, you know, what you were describing is your face, it's tracking your face and you, ch you change the orientation of your face relative to the camera mm -hmm. and something happens to the content. So designing in, yeah, those elements that can respond to real-time input, be uh -huh. it um, audio or the light or, yeah, the device orientation or your proximity to it, if that changes the content, that definitely makes the whole experience a lot more seamless. Mm -hmm. And um, again, and, and then thinking about if it's not a selfie filter and it, it, perhaps it's like augmented reality in or mixed reality in the world uh -huh. um, and you're sort of viewing it through the lens, then sort of a, a really big consideration is what, what is it, how is it blending? How is this content blending with the physical world? And is there any relationship between the physical world and the content? And, that, and that's part of the magic of making it seem, you know, like a really effective experience. If, if you're just slapping content mm -hmm. that doesn't bear any relationship, for example, it doesn't have a shadow or it doesn't relate to the physical environment, then, then that sort of definitely loses the magic and it's a little bit more like graffiti or, you know, something. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, blending, definitely designing, thinking of um, the environment and or the real-time changes that can happen with the content is, is part of, part of, um, making that effective. Yeah. It kind of reminds me of like, I guess the non selfie version of that, of it being in the world is kind of like the way the Pokemon go phenomenon yeah. started where you would see like a Charizard across the street sitting on a car or something yeah. like, so, so crazy. I, I can't believe that fat is already what, three, four years old. Oh my God. They crushed it. That's still like a <laughs> reference in every, in every pitch and brief, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, it's so notable. <laughs> and so. I, actually I wanted to touch on, I just spoke about mm -hmm. AR when you're talking about what makes the seamless experience, but there's this really yeah. interesting thing in VR as well. Um, I'm really interested in, um, sort of combining, it's hard in the pandemic. It's not really possible, but combining theatrics, real real life theatrics with VR. Oh, wow. And it's kind of, they, you know, there's been a couple of um, experiences in this and it's a little bit like um, Sleep No More or, or you know, that mm -hmm. immersive theater. But if you add another layer of um, having a VR experience, so let's just say like the VR experience is um, you're in a room and there's, you're surrounded by, Know, chairs, whatever. Mm -hmm. If the if the VR room that you enter is exactly the same as the real room, it starts to really fuse um, that illusion of what is real and what is not. Uh -huh. <laughs> and so that's like a really, really uh, powerful sort of um, theatrical mechanic to to combine with VR, which I love thinking about. It's it's just it's so insane that that's something that we can do today. It's like when people think about what was the future going to look like to people from like 20, 30 years ago <laughs> plus? Um, or th I would, I actually would rather say like 30, 40 years ago because 20 years ago, I feel like those kids just grew up, like they were born into technology. <laughs> so um, it, it's just so crazy that we, we don't have flying cars, but we have VR and augmented reality. So we're getting there. <laughs> yeah. I actually, I mean, on that note, not to, to, to curveball us, but I saw a headline yesterday that some company has just invested a lot of money in the like flying Uber space. So oh. I feel like it's not long. <laughs> okay, here we go. 2025. We'll yeah. see you. <laughs> um, so shifting gears from AR to VR, which we kind of started to a little bit, um, what characteristics or key elements are inherent to virtual reality? So, um, I mean, it, yeah, this is why I love virtual reality. It's like got so many other sort of different components than the other two, but, um, so it is 
all about this virtual world. You have to create a whole other world mm-hmm. which has, you know, an imaginary space that sort of has um, interactions and relations to the viewer that are specific to that world. And, and so the creator of that world defines things like, you know, gravity, where mm-hmm. the horizon is, a sense of um, grounding, um, you know, you can totally change the laws of physics and time uh, mm-hmm. if you're the creator. Got a little bit of a god complex, but it's yeah, it's really great. <laughs> There's also, um, of course, the fact that it's totally immersive, so uh-huh. you're completely immersed in the virtual space um, and and sort of cut off from reality almost entirely on a sensory level. Um, being that VR headsets sort of encompass your total, you know, your whole field of vision rather than just a part of it. Mm-hmm. And headphones sort of achieve similar results, which, which you know, amazingly, just by taking over our vision and our sound, it um, really quickly affects our grounding on, um, you know, psychological grounding of where we are. Mm-hmm. There's also sensory feedback. So, um, you know, your there are other cameras, depth sensors that are tracking and obviously um, controllers that are tracking where we are in, in, in our position so that our heads and bodies are sort of given the illusion that, you know, we see our whole body moving in the virtual world. Uh Um, So it's like a lot closer to reality than sort of what it would be through a, you know, through a device. Mm -hmm. And then sort of like, I guess, it was designing for that virtual world. There's certain things we can add to make it, again, this sense of illusion um, of this other world is like putting in interactive triggers such as... um, being able to pick things up and throw them down. Um, I don't know, being able to sort of break, break a mug or whatever, all these sort of things help us trip us into this um, believability. Mm-hmm. Um, and then sort of the final, I mean, not the final, there's so many components and characteristics that make VR VR, but there's sort of like um, some things to look out for when you're designing for it. Um, and that is, I guess, one of the main challenges that VR has experienced is uh, making sure it's comfortable for the user and making sure there's things like um, no sudden no sudden movement from A to B, uh-huh. uh, making sure that there's no sort of... Um, in animation, we often talk about curves uh-huh. and that's like easing into and out of things so that it's not like a hard stop. But actually in VR, if you start adding curves there's this sort of like motion sickness feeling, which is um, surprising. So it's like, don't add curves. You should have like, you know, some hard stops, but then don't make, you know, don't, don't transport viewers very quickly from A to B as in like, don't cover a lot of ground because, and I was really interested in this because, you know, I've experienced that feeling of sickness when that happens, but I couldn't quite figure out like why that makes you feel sick. And um, it's, and anyway, looked into it and it's because that your body thinks it's been poisoned. (laughs) So, so this traveling really quickly, if, you know, in a strange way from A to B as a human, like, we're like, oh gosh, no, this is not right. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, thinking about things like that, and, and that's a little bit different to, um, you know, I think everyone's aware that in the earlier sort of days of commercial VR, a lot of people were getting motion sickness mm-hmm. and that was with a frame rate, um, like a sort of latency and frame rate, which is a little different, but, um, yeah, anyway, so, so making sure the experience is not bad for a human is part of the discovery. Yeah. And that's so funny because, so I have vertigo and (laughs) (laughs) I've tried so many times to really like experience VR and it just, it doesn't agree with me at all. And it's very difficult for me to like actually enjoy some of it. There's a few. So if, if I've noticed which ones I can handle and which ones I can't. So I personally, if I'm standing and it's a headset and I have something in my hands, I feel fine because I'm controlling where I'm looking. But if I'm in one of those, like I went to the exhibit that was on, I don't know if it's still there because of COVID, but it was on um, 34th Street, I believe, in the city. I think it was just like a virtual reality, like world kind of thing. I know the one, yeah. 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 And you sat in this car. And it was like a race car kind of augmented or virtual reality. And I, (laughs) I had to, I was like, get me out of here. I cannot be in here. Like I felt so nauseous and sick. And then I was just, 
I would like my vertigo was triggered for the rest of the night. And I was oh, like, no. damn it. And oh. I wanna, I wanted, I wanted to do so many more things. There was another one that it kind of looked like you were flying and you were like controlling these controllers with your feet and your hands and everything. And then you had a headset on and I couldn't do any of it after that. So it, it makes complete sense what you just described, because, you know, first of all, with the coughing, it was probably speeding, you know, giving them the virtual effect of speeding from A to yeah. B yep. and your body's like not feeling the G forces or anything. Uh-huh. there, And so you're like, okay, I'm poisoned. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but also, um, and we'll talk about this probably later on, but like uh-huh. the, um, if you could have seen your hands and your feet, your virtual hands and your feet, and they correlated to your real hands and feet in the experience, I'm curious as to maybe, I feel like maybe you wouldn't have felt as sick. And yeah. then, you know, there's that, um, y- your brain does some, this little trick when, when you can actually feel your virtual body, mm-hmm. um, that prevents that kind of feeling. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's pr- maybe that's why I felt so much more comfortable with the one I was standing with and like seeing my hands and seeing my feet and being able to move them. And I think I was like fighting zombies or something, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, yeah. which is yeah. also very fun. <laughs> yeah. Um. So then kind of going into the other side that you were talking about of like what we're seeing spatially in front of us when we're in one of these experiences, what are the basic identities to be considered when creating an avatar? Oh, uh, yeah. So this is a, it's, it's a, it's an interesting question to try and cover. Um, and I guess there's, there's two like, there's two routes of avatar design concept mm-hmm. taken. And there's that of, um, emulating humans, creating avatars that, you know, look like us. And then there's another route where you could create or offer avatars that are fictional mm-hmm. and, you know, don't represent the person. And I think we're used to sort of thinking about avatars as the ones that represent us. Cause for some reason, you know, that's a fun process to try and get an avatar that looks like you, mm-hmm. but that's also, you know, from a creative perspective, traditionally fraught with, you know, problems of inclusivity and making sure you offer enough options for everyone. Mm-hmm. And you, you know, you need look any further than the sort of emojis on your phone to understand like there's this huge range and complexity of skin tones face shapes um, and sort of gender stereotypes, fashion stereotypes, body types, all that kind of stuff, um, which needs to be designed for to be, you know, inclusive on Mm -hmm. a realistic realm for all avatars, you know, and then it's difficult. It's difficult if you're, if you're creating an XR um, experience, it's difficult to optimize that process because you would have to create all those assets for for that to be possible. So anyway, you could design a really, um, I don't know, clever system to sort of create a system that could, uh, you know, give you a, a sliding range of all those things um, to make sure that that's a, that's a, you know, politically correct way to do it. And mm-hmm. machine learning is becoming really helpful in that area of being able to sort of take a picture of someone or see someone's face, mm-hmm. be able to recreate its face shape, skin tone, hair color, hairstyle, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, it, sorry, and sort of the other route that I was talking about is to sort of go the fictional route um, and give give users the choice of not not necessarily representing what they look like, but maybe a better version of themselves or something that they imagine themselves as. And, um, you know, there's some really fun ones too. We, we recently did a project and we had to meet with our clients on VR chat. And VR chat, the sort of default avatars are like it giant banana and a fedora so you know if my if that's what i'm if i choose a giant banana and a fedora as my avatar the other interesting thing that happens is is i'm less likely to behave you know like myself like i'm a you know 33 year old 58 white lady i'm more likely to behave like a banana and a fedora hat which is <laughs> interesting as well yeah so On this podcast, we've been talking about real-world inclusivity a lot from gender, ethnicity, to disability. And you started to allude to this. Should we be cognizant of avatars and inclusivity? And, you know, I'm just thinking about, like, bitmojis and whatnot. And, like, are, are are these changes that we're going to be seeing more of as, you know, the times are changing? Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned Bitmoji because that's great. Um, there's this, 
it was like two years ago, I think, when we were, yeah, it must have been, <laughs> when we were still able to go to conferences. But Snapchat had their annual conference and they um, released this very cool, and everyone got their, you know, their name tag to walk around with. And there's a QR code on the name pad. And of course, if you scan it, there was a little um, AR effect. And the AR effect was this very cool, it was the bit mo. it's your bit mm -hmm. if you have one, would sort of climb up and around the name tag. And so that was, um, I mean, I love that because already people have already input their own choice of what they look like as their Bitmoji. And they just use that skin on a, you know, 3D mesh and animated it to be the experience. And I, I really love that. I thought that was really um, a sort of, so long as, I guess, so long as the user has the input into what they look like, um, then, then all these sort of uh, avatar creation tools can be um, inclusive mm -hmm. uh, and people can identify how they want to. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. I think it's really important that people have um, a lot of choice over what their uh, identity looks like as an avatar, but it's also really, really great to um, give choices that don't carry as much stereotyped weight as that. For you know, so giant bananas, humanoid frogs, and like wine bottles, you know, whatever. Yeah. Well, even <laughs> like there is that there is those you know the one the filters that you can turn and you know look outward at the space that you're in and and I'm moving my arms around as if anyone who's listening to this is gonna be able to see me. <laughs> um, but and there is like a little like dancing lizard or like like you yeah, said yeah. like a banana and a hat or something like that. So. It's just, it's, it's so intriguing to think of like all of the things that come into play to create something like that and to understand how that works in each, you know, anyone could be anywhere putting that out there into their yeah. space, if you will. Um, so we've seen the term embodiment being used when talking about first person perspective avatars. What does it really mean to embody an avatar? Um, so when that when you embody an avatar, um, there's this kind of crazy cognitive thing that happens in our brains. And, and I'm talking about um, specifically about virtual reality at, in, at this point. Uh -huh. um, so it's kind of the only place that you could embody an avatar, I think. Um, but anyway, we experience this illusion of body ownership. So it's as if the avatar has, avatar's body has temporarily become our own body, which is um, kind of, it's a, phenomenon there's a name I, I think it's called um virtual embodiment mm -hmm. but then and on that point there's like this fairly well circulated experiment that people can even try at home if they want to and it's called the rubber hand illusion and if you were to like put a rubber hand down in front of someone and then you block their vision of their real hand which is next to it and you say you um a second person is stroking uh, simultaneously sort of stroking um, or touching the person's hand at the same time as the rubber hand. So it's the illusion that the rubber hand, you, you, your brain quickly begins to think that the rubber hand is your own hand. Uh -huh. uh, and it's kind of, and that's to do with sort of, you know, the neuroplasticity of our brain. It starts to really own this fake thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so anyway, this, this virtual embodiment is, is really, really powerful in in, from a psychological perspective. Um, and then there's this sort of second thing that's happened uh, that happens when you are in this virtual body. Uh, in addition to body ownership, our sense of self gets transported to the body of our avatar. So in a way, we sort of like become and start behaving uh, as our avatars. Uh -huh. And um, one of the first sort of studies or demonstrations of this, um, they, they've called the Proteus effect, which is where the appearance of an avatar um, actually has the ability to modify the behavior of the person wearing it. So then if you're, um, you know, and part of this experiment showed that like, if you're um, in a more attractive avatar body, then you're more likely to disclose more personal information <laughs> when approached by other avatars. <laughs> which is interesting. And then there's, you know, um, avatars that were taller than shorter ones displayed more confidence when negotiating a task. Um, and then, of course, research has sort of continued in this area um, in experiments of, of um, you know, changing people's, wanting to change people's empathy levels um, based on the avatar body they're in, which, um, you know, can be applied to different genders, um, different races, different perspectives on a situation, 
Um, and there's a really interesting experiment I was sort of learning about the other day where um, it can even shift the perception of seeing another version of yourself. Um, and I'm, I would do a really bad job of trying to explain that experiment, but uh, <laughs> that's, it's basically like, you know, if you were to, if you're all of a sudden talking to yourself, another version of yourself, uh-huh. you, you behave quite differently and it's, it's kind of fascinating. Um, but yeah. And, and so there's, I think there's ongoing experiments about um, whether we can use this sort of embodiment illusion for good and whether those effects are long, long term and long lasting, depending on how many exposures you have to that. So could you change someone's inherent biases um, or, you know, uh, empathy towards another person based on the differences between you and them? Is that a possible form of, you know, therapy and um, using VR for good? So. Um, Yes, <laughs> that's that's what it means to embody an avatar. <laughs> so still on the topics of ethics, but looking to the future, as XR continues to become more immersed in our everyday lives, are there issues around morality and social responsibility that need to be reckoned with as we continue to innovate and explore these extended realities? Yes. Um, I mean, using tech for good and bad has been a question it's, a, it's an ongoing question probably ever since the invention of the printing press, you know, will it be used for good or bad? Um, and I think the answer is yes. <laughs> like, yes, it will be used for good uh-huh. or bad. Um, but, but I think um, for the most part, I think that in terms of creation, I feel like humans are constantly trying to, you know, spend a lot of time and money creating things for the betterment of our own species uh-huh. and, and, and in that realm hopefully we just fill the space with lots of good uses and I mean up until this point and pr- sort of in the time that we're in now I feel like things like mixed reality and virtual reality um, and even augmented reality are there's a certain cost barrier to get over to to create and so anyone who's trying to trying to create something evil would would have a hard time I mean, I mean what a waste of resources um, <laughs> but but uh, It's not to say it wouldn't happen, but then there's also sort of, uh, there's been a lot of chat about, you know, creating metaverses and online games that are, you know, another version of real life. And um, of course I talked about how great the escapism is in being part of another world online. And I'm sure there's a lot of discussions to be had about whether um, prolonged periods of escapism are good for us or bad for us. Um, Is it good to be forming relationships online in other ultimate versus metaverses Mm -hmm. um is it bad for us um i think i think there's an argument to be made for both sides you know um the sort of if you can fulfill your sort of social needs online (laughs) in the world we live in today particularly during a pandemic that's probably a good thing yeah but um i think when the world was less locked down it, it was definitely seen as a quite a bad thing negative thing um so, so I think there's, yeah, so many different discussions. And like I was just saying, like using, using VR in therapy treatments and it's, you know, strong capabilities in the psychological sense, um, even further, like if there's, there's sort of some interesting things to be said about what Elon Musk is doing with, um, I think it's called Neuralink. Mm-hmm. Uh, those things could all be used for bad for sure. Yeah. But I feel like uh, if we fill the space with good things, then um, the bad things won't won't be as prominent. (laughs) Yeah. So going off script just a little bit, I've been seeing a lot on social media recently about people who are making old photos come alive. Oh, yeah. And then also (laughs) people like putting celebrities faces on other people and then them like moving around and walking around and stuff. And it looks like it's like one was Tom Cruise and it looked like it was actually Tom Cruise. And then, you know, people taking pictures of their deceased grandparents when they were younger and making the picture move. And it's, it freaks me out a little bit. I'm not going to (laughs) lie. Like what goes into something like that? Um, so that, I mean, that's just like taking, so tracking a face, a face mesh. Mm -hmm. We all, we all have these points of um, correlation between all our faces, mm-hmm. but they're all slightly different. And so you're just sort of remapping someone else's anim- facial animations to a different face mesh. And it takes, you know, the, this sort of very sophisticated technology to, to do that very quickly. 
and it's getting better and better. And that is, you know, everything to do with deep fakes, mm-hmm. which we've all heard about and know about. And yeah, to that point, like that is, um, I saw an article the other day, a colleague posted about um, in England or in the UK, the um, there's a new ru- advertising standards authority ruling mm-hmm. that influencers have to say, you know, they have to disclose when they're using face filters, uh-huh. when promoting products, which to me is fascinating because I, and I get it. Um, but for me, you know, working in visual effects, visual effects have been around for 30 years and we've been retouching yeah. <laughs> peeps for a long time. <laughs> and, you know, I don't, I don't see the real difference. I think the difference is that now we're putting these visual effects in the hands of the users Mm -hmm. and things like, yeah, face swapping and um, being able to create fakes really quickly um, is we are really handing over the reins to consumers and, uh, yeah, consumers don't, are not beholden to any advertising standards. So, um, yeah, it's going to be interesting. I think that's like actually a, this authentic, I, I, I wonder if there'll be like a rebellion against XR in that sense or AR at least um, with, you know, the loss of authenticity. Yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's, interesting. it's interesting also because like you'll, you know, the, the funniest thing that I've, I've noticed with filters becoming like more rampant is like there's, there's obviously like the dating apps and stuff and people are always like, <laughs> I don't, I'm not going to swipe right on you if you're full of filters or something like that, or if all of your photos are filtered. And I think it's so interesting now also that, you know, when Instagram first instilled all of their selfie filters or any sort of filters, you didn't know if someone was using it, but now it says it in the top corner there. You can't get away with not doing it. And I think it, I, I personally think for people, especially for the youth and, you know, the younger generations that are using this, it is important for them to know that like when, like I use this one filter all the time. So does my sister. Just, we just like the way we look with it, but mm-hmm. it's not real. Like I use it because I don't like to put on makeup every day <laughs> and like, right. but it's, yeah. but it's funny. Because, and and I, I don't mind that it says it up there. Cause no, I don't look like that in real life. Like that's fine. But it's, it's just interesting that there's so many people who are just so they try to like skirt around it. Like, no, that's really what I look like. I don't want anyone to know I used that filter. Yeah. And I think, I mean, there's so many issues to delve into there. It's like, I guess it's up to someone's own like level of security, insecurity, security Mm -hmm. as to whether they want to disclose whether that's, you know, there's so so much to unpack. Yeah. But um, yeah, in, in terms of like makeup, let's just say like, I feel like women have had to spend a lot of money on makeup and you know throughout their whole lives and now you know if you don't give us a free to, filter yeah. <laughs> i love to see it <laughs> so in in one of the articles you wrote towards the beginning of the pandemic you hypothesized two major areas of change for ar in particular one was the heightened self-expression and the removal of self-broadcasting stigmas, and two, using AR effects as a means of production. So how have you seen these areas progress in the last year? Um, yeah, it's, yeah, so, I mean, just what we were talking mm-hmm. about in terms of, like, losing the stigma is exactly that. Like, um, is it okay for people to, like, be wearing, fil- you know, AR filters? do influencers want to do it? And I think, yeah, in the past year, yeah, like everyone's lost the stigma or well, not everyone, but a lot of people I think are totally okay with using AR effects mm-hmm. as um, enhancements. Um, and even, you know, of, of course the fun ones are always fun, silly to do, but even the more serious and subtle ones are, are, are totally prominent. I see a lot of influencers using them without, you know, without even removing the label saying that they're using it, which is great. Um, and in terms of um, the sort of using it as a means of production, I yeah, yes and no. It's interesting. I feel like production companies and people with um, very powerful tools have been using AR and real-time sort of body tracking and whatnot and combining these things to make really, really cool um, strides in areas like fashion um, and, I don't know, just, just sort of creating in real time which is not what I meant when I predicted it, (laughs) but that's cool. What I meant was like, I I was kind of hoping to see a lot more like people at home using, 
using AR effects that already exist mm. as part of their visual effects capabilities. And I'm sh I, I haven't seen that much. I haven't seen that much. It's probably out there, but um, people, are, I think people are more interested in creating their own content for AR yeah. and seeing that in the world other, rather than like using what's already been made. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Definitely. So now that we're hopefully recovering and soon enough emerging from this extremely long pandemic, <laughs> what, <laughs> what are the future opportunities and challenges ahead for extended realities? Uh, so yeah, I guess, I guess it's, there's two things that come to mind. Mm -hmm. Um, the first one we already talked about, which is that level of like fakery and authenticity. And are we okay with fakes, you know, as consumers? It feels like a lot of us are. And then maybe it's a division, you know, it's really curious. I'm, I'm really curious to see what happens in terms of um, all the media we consume, everyone being fully aware that deep fakes are very realistic and possible. And then even shallow fakes, like, you know, let's call an AR effect a shallow fake. Mm -hmm. like. Um, Curious to see what happens uh, in, in terms of our consumption of stuff. I think it'll go on. I think we'll just be less less interested in believing it, um, which which is going to have curious effects on things like journalism. But um, and then, and then the second thing is um, you know hype cycles around technology. Mm -hmm. So when something is being prototyped and um, you see little snippets of proof of concept videos coming out of new tech people get really excited mm -hmm. and uh, media gets really excited and they predict a lot of things are going to come next year, next year, uh, you know, and there's this ex expectation from creators and consumers that um, we're going to have access to that technology in a few months. And then sometimes it takes a lot longer for that technology to evolve. VR is a really great example of that mm -hmm. and, I, and XR in general and mixed reality, actually let's, let's hop on mixed reality for a second. Yeah. Um, <laughs> because it is definitely one that's been hyped for a long time, but the tech try as try as many companies might, the tech just hasn't um, being able to use MR glass technology mm -hmm. has been a difficult difficult thing to overcome and to sort of invent, you know. So uh, there's been a lot of hype about that. I feel like 2021 we're going to see a lot of a lot of MR glasses being released i feel like we're almost there but there was this sort of huge hype about it and a huge you know disappointment as <laughs> as it didn't come out <laughs> so xr i think we'll always have that that challenge of people wanting it now and it the tech sometimes takes a little longer sometimes it happens really rapidly but um yeah that's uh that's kind of i think the two main areas that are going to be fascinating for for xr so exciting. And like I like I keep saying, I can't I can't find another word to use other than fascinating because as a user and consumer of filters and mm -hmm. and you know, putting little weird lizard things on my desk in the middle of the day <laughs> to distract me sometimes. Um it's it's just so cool to hear it from the side of of a creator. Um mm -hmm. so uh thank you so much, Sally, for for being a part of this episode today and for sharing all of this knowledge. It's been so amazing to learn all about uh, all the different realities outside of the one that we're living in every day. Because, <laughs> you know, we all need a little mental vacation these days. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, thank you so much for, for chatting. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. Thanks, everybody, for listening to today's episode. You can learn more about Mill Talk by following The Mill via at Mill Channel across platforms. You can also learn more about Lime Studios via at limestudios.tv on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. Don't forget to search the hashtag Mill Talk to stay in the know on serious topics and guests. We'll see you next time.